If you're in the right spot, you're, you're interested in observing your applications, like figuring out what they're doing with various things. Um, and uh, we're actually cobbling together a couple presentations so that you have different ways of, of looking at this, obviously, with the spring focus. And uh, we are both not Adrian. I, I'm the Adrian here. Um, and I'm, I'm John Schneider. Yeah. And uh, we both work at Pivotal, though, so we are one in, in that way. That <laughs> so um, I'm going to let uh, John, who has a spicier intro, uh, start first. It's a spicier and, intro. Than you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to go with your lunch. So To go with your lunch, yeah. Let's have it. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a dark intro, but uh, bear with me. Do we have any, uh, do we have any vets, in the, like military vets in the audience? We got one. What was your uh, branch, uh, sir? Navy? Yep. All right, excellent. Sorry about that. Um, the, uh, I, was, uh, I spent quite a bit of time in the, in the Army, actually, and uh, spent quite a bit of time overseas as well. And there was a, there was a point at which uh, my brigade commander, I was a junior officer at the time, my brigade commander, he would ask a question you know, about what was going on and so forth. And you'd say, uh, well, I hope. You know, this or that's happening, right? He used the word hope. And he would always latch onto that and just tear into you, you know, and just say, hope is not a course of action. I don't want to hear the word hope. And it's, it's uh, you're either measuring and knowing what's going on or you don't. You know, hope doesn't factor into things. Um, I really thought about that a lot uh, as it went along uh, through that year. And, you know, of course, since then, I've thought about the application to, uh, to software as well. You know, how often do we know what's really happening versus just kind of hope everything's working correctly um, until it's you know, immediately obvious to us that it isn't. Um, a little later on in the year, we, one of the, so I ran uh, gun trucks, this convoy escort. I would, you know, my platoon, we would escort convoys going up and down the roads of Iraq. And one of our biggest threats uh, at that time was this uh, device called an explosively formed projectile. These things are really deadly to us. That's why I said this could be a little dark. Um, they were really tricky for us to find uh, because they were really well disguised. They'd be, you know, cast in concrete, you know, painted to look like a rock. So if you're just flying down the road at 38 miles an hour, you, it's almost impossible to see one of these things sitting on the side of the road. And uh, what we found, like, uh, what we found is that because it wasn't actually a rock, that uh, it would actually, it's heat it would give off more heat at night than, uh, than a normal rock. And so if you could look at it through thermal binoculars, you could look at a pile of rocks, you could see one of these explosive devices very clearly in your thermal binoculars because you know, it wasn't actually a real rock. But, uh, but it's tricky because uh, thermal binoculars can't see through glass. So you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place you know, here. You either are able, yeah. You're either able to see, you know, the explosive device, or you're you're exposing yourself in another way. So, um, my platoon came up, you know, at, at the time, what was really common. Soldiers, this was like 2006, 2005. They uh, the PlayStation Portable was a big thing amongst like junior soldiers. It's like, you know, it's way back, but um, these uh, thermal binoculars had those. Uh, like auxiliary, or I don't even know what you call them, like the red, white, yellow uh, cables that could attach to them, and that could attach to the PlayStation Portable. So we rigged up a uh, thing that you could put on the outside of the truck um, that was connected to their PlayStation Portables inside the truck, and then we used an extra turret joystick to you know, move the thermal binoculars back and forth. And this is like, so you know, and that, and that way we got the best of both worlds, we could see you know, what was coming up, uh, you know, down the road and also not expose herself to, to direct fire. So it was one of those things where, like, you know, early, early, uh, early, uh, you know, adult life, I learned, you know, measurement can be essential to survival. And while what we're doing right now isn't nearly as, as dramatic, um, it really is important for our apps, too, that we measure them in a way that's effective and know um, whether they're working or not. And so we're going to show you a, a few different ways of doing that and, and the differences between them and when you should be doing what. So, Adrian. So I guess you want to know and be able to see an app crashing but not be the app that's crashing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's the connection. Um, so, so sometimes people use the word observability 
to describe this sort of understanding uh, of applications and, and or production requests. And uh, one of the things that's that's kind of unifying across a bunch of tools in this space is that uh, uh, it's all it all is based on events. And so at the end of the day, like our, our first event system was Hello World, right? We're, we're uh, system out Printland, Hello World. You know, we're actually sending an event to the console handler. And um, so we're, we're pretty good at that and logging at least that way if we're developers, uh, maybe too much. And, um, you know, but you know, the raw events that we have um, can also be turned into higher order events like trends and statistics and things. And uh, metrics is usually the, the uh, name of, of that space. And uh, one of the other um, you know, types of, of uh, tooling areas in observability is, is tracing. Um, and that's where we're recording things, but we also kind of keep track of, of, their, um, of their heritage. So like where did this event come from and where is it going? And, and connecting that calls tree together. Um, the unifying theory part is credit to Coda Hale, which made some libraries that uh, influenced tech before Micrometer did. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So one of the nice things about, um, uh, about technology is it tends to relate to other technologies we have in different ways. And um, Peter Bergen, uh, who's, who's uh, uh, done, done a lot of work in this space, uh, came up with a, a neat um, diagram to help show some overlaps. Like on one hand, you have um, things that produce a lot more data and, and, and things that have a lot, um, a lot finer grain information. Um, and if we look at the way, way all these things um, um, relate, they also help tease out what their cardinal features, what are they adding value. So we know logging um, adds value because at, at least we know Something happened at a specific time, and probably there's some ways for us to roll that up together to know, you know what cluster it was related, related to or, or what IP addresses were involved. And to a certain degree, um, because tracing is also um, connecting events together, there's an overlap there. Because, for example, if there's an exception in a stack trace in your log, you might be able to find through the calls tree whether that exception actually uh, kicked in a, a fallback uh, and didn't result in a customer facing failure, or whether it did, um, or whether it was an exception that had nothing to do with any, any customer requests. So sort of like that, uh, that heritage there. And I mean, events in, uh, that, are, that are connected together into a, into a trace, um, you know, they also have a, a key fact there, um, which, is, which is a latency, like how long a particular event, uh, uh, sorry, an operation took place. And when we think about things like uh, latency, for example, that's, that's one of the things that we tend to chart and trend together. So combining together that, you could find um, some relationships between um, like how, how the whole system is doing, like whether setting off alerts, and um, get that broader context. These, these areas, they just keep winding together because if you think about it going the other way, like there's a lot of folks here who probably use um, Elasticsearch and ELK and, and different stacks where you can take and, and parse log files and then, and then get metrics out of those. So, so, th so these, these tools kind of connect together in different ways. They may not connect out of the box, but, but oftentimes there's a lot of, of areas where they overlap. And, and that's helpful to know um, that, the, that they are, in fact, different while, while they still do um, color the same stories. And I mean, John and I are, 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 are co-presenting here, so I'm going to just remind him he can jump, jump in. in at any point in time. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this together, so uh, if you have any Keep anything. going. No? OK. We're going to keep going. You, you, got me, you got me sold here. All right. Yes. All right. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to face any of your, his other uh, PlayStation Portable contraptions. They might be more lethal than the right. heat viewer. Um, but to kind of, you know, this is all kind of like uh, abstractions, right? So let's, let's use something to drive it home. Uh, concretely speaking, uh, we know that uh, latency is a, like a customer-focused um, uh, metric. 
uh, when things take too long, we'll definitely scroll off the page, shut off our apps, or maybe even go to a different service if it happens long enough. So let's use latency to, to talk about these things. And in this case, I'm just gonna like vaguely use the, the response time word. There's lots of ways for us to, to color that. Um, and uh, you know, it, we've all seen um, latency, uh, at, at least regards to timeouts and things probably by accident bubbling up to browsers. But we, we'll find them in, in all of these places, logs, metrics, and traces. One of the things that's, that this will help us do is, is compare the, the types of things that the tools create. And so if I was looking at like a formatted log statement and I was using my favorite um, analytical tool, grep and, and bash, I could probably parse out uh, quickly enough um, you know, which field might have the, the time that the operation took. If I'm this lucky, which I'm usually not, there will be a field that says how long it is and I won't have to compare the last line with the next line, you know, with, with the line that had the start of that request and the one that had the finish of the request. Um, so I happen to be really lucky because I made this slide and, and uh, I know its format, um, esoteric as it is, it, it's microseconds because you know, we're in microservices, um, but uh, most of the time tools talk in milliseconds because they're not like microservices yet. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so if I knew this format, I could this probably This is a joke, color. by the way. Yeah, sorry. Just in case that wasn't clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to remind when I joke because I'm not that yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, so. yeah. So, so look, you know, this took 95 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. That's fair. And if, if we look at the same data from, um, from a metrics perspective, there's many different ways to visualize the latency, but this is one um, that, you know, we've purposefully created for this uh, demonstration, but because this is a... Because there's heat involved. Because there's heat involved. <laughs> um, because this is a rock that... that it, that's right, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is a latency heat map. So along the x-axis we have time, along the y-axis we have latency, and these individual boxes you see that are colored uh, represent the total number of uh, recordings inside that bucket. So, you know, from down where it's, where most of the samples, you know, and I'm gonna use that term loosely, where most of the samples occur is down there in the, you know, nine millisecond range somewhat. Um, but we see samples as high as 440 milliseconds or even above that. And so, you know, using something like metrics, metrics since it aggregates all of the individual events into, you know, into a statistic or several statistics that you can represent in different ways, we could start to answer the question, is 95 milliseconds slow relative to the normative timing? Um, how fast were most requests at 1107? What does the worst case scenario look like? And so forth. Uh, do I care? Like would I care if it's green or not? I mean, why would I care? Yeah. and. You know, and this, this comes down to, um, to, to how we monitor things. I think when you, when you look at the, the next slide here, um, we have, you're, you're going to set some certain expectations in your organization concerning what the service level uh, availability or objective is going to be for your, for your call. And suppose, you know, my objective was that, you know, all requests are under 50 milliseconds. Here I can see you know, there's some percentage of them that are, that are exceeding that uh, service level objective. Um, where we get into trouble, I think uh, you know, there's a wide range of sophistication in terms of monitoring systems and what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of capabilities they give you. Um, on the, the least sophisticated end, they really only allow you to look at, say, average latency. That's a very common thing we see folks looking at is just average latency. Um, of course, the average here is difficult to tell from a heat map, but it's probably somewhere down in the nine millisecond range. But there are users of this service experiencing um, latencies in excess of 440 milliseconds. So, you know, it, 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 it's kind of helpful to illustrate that breakdown. We, we kind of have this principle with regards to latency in metrics that, um, and I'll just state this and we can break it down, but when we think about metrics, we should alert on max latency and 
performance tuned to high percentiles. Uh, and this is why. When you, when you look at this graph here, there's, there's a, the top, you know, very um, oscillating line, gray dashed line at the top represents the max latency. And you see it hits about 100 milliseconds is the worst case scenario. This is, a real, this is real production traffic from one of our customers, by the way, we got on a support channel. Um, there's, a, there's no PII data, don't worry. Yes. It's been, yeah. Um, there's a line that's, that's a little bit further down, just under uh, one millisecond, that's like a purple dashed line. That represents the average. And then there's three lines generally below that. There's a red one and an orange one and a yellow one that get progressively harder to see from a distance. Um, that represent the 99th, 95th, and 75th percentiles of the data. And so, um, you know, I often hear folks starting with average and then thinking, um, well, I'll know more about what my uh, users experience if I look at the 99th percentile instead, and so they'll alert on that. In this case, you can see the 99th percentile often falls below the average, in fact. Um, that really surprises a lot of folks. Uh, you so know, you're I get saying that 99% of the re requests perform faster than the than average. 50% of the requests. <laughs> yeah, at least fa faster than the average, yeah. you know, as the mean. Um, and this, it doesn't take much for this to happen. You know, if, if all your samples are tightly packed around the 99th and then you have a max that's two orders of magnitude worse, then the average sneaks above the 99th. So it's, it's really surprising, I think, how these things kind of play out. Um, if you're, the reason we say alert on max is because your users are experiencing, some percentage of your users are experiencing that max. And if you don't know what it is, you really don't know what their user experience looks like. Um, we'll show at the very end, there's, there's a, a Spring, the Spring Boot webinar that Phil used to demonstrate Spring Boot 2. Just, it's a simple app, uses, uh, uses MongoDB, to, fetch a few things, you know, it's, there's nothing really much to it. Um, the average is down at, you know, four or five milliseconds, something like that. The worst case latency is 12 seconds. 12 seconds, like it's, it's way up there. Um, and, uh, you know, so we often hear like, well, those are spurious. Spurious is something your users are experiencing. Um, so then we start, if we look at Max, then we start, and we alert on it, we start thinking about what can I do to compensate for these situations? You know, could I use a load balancing strategy where I ship two requests and discard all but the first one that comes back? Maybe I'll smooth out some of those, those things. So but, the more information you know, the better you can tell what to do with the information and... That's right. And, and whether you should take action or not. That's right, yeah, you, you're at least aware of it, and that's the key. We, now, the second part of this, we say performance tuned to high percentiles because those, the things that cause that max are often things that you can't control. It's garbage collection, it's VM pauses, it's something like that. You're never gonna performance tune those things away. You know, you can make garbage, perf garbage uh, collection happen in less frequently, but it's gonna happen at some point. Um, so if you look at the, you know, 99 or 99.9 .9 percentile for performance tuning, you can do a pretty good job of doing everything you can in your code to improve the performance of your app. And so also 99th is a good way of looking at applications comparatively. If you've got two versions of code running, you can look at the 99th on both of them to perform some differential comparison between them. So that's our principle, alert on max, performance tuned to high percentiles. And this yeah. sort of like northern lights effect, is that pretty normal with the applications? I mean, the, where you've got the, you know, the different patterns of the... It is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this, is, this, is, very, this is very common. What's, What's actually less common is to represent a heat map like this where you do see heat maps. Usually they're represented as spectral images, you know, the multicolored red, orange, purple, you know, colors like that. Um, and spectral distributions tend to hide these things up top just because of the, it, if I had represented the same graph as a spectral distribution, I would see a bright line around nine milliseconds and nothing else. Okay, so here um, you can basically see that there's actually a pretty large population of requests. It's not large, but it's, you know, it's I mean, 1% or less than 1%. You know, the scale has been, oh, you know, the, the factor has been uh, exaggerated so that it is visible. But, oh, okay. um, 
Yeah, watch those scales. People monkey with numbers all the That's time. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. How to lie with statistics, right? I'm here so, for so you. So if I'm a manager, I just change the. <laughs> That's right. The you just tune it level? down, okay. or you just use the prettier spectral version of it, and then you really won't be worried about anything. Cool. These yeah. are good, good tips. Yeah. Good tips. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, so traces. Uh, so that was, that was awesome stuff about the context. I mean, traces have a different type of context because they tell you a context of that one thing that happened with the, with the singular things that happened before it. So for example, you'll get um, information about like the, the client side of the call into your, your application and anything that, that any knock-on calls that, that happened from there. And so it's that different type of context, this request context, is, is where, where traces will, will show you some value. And in some ways where it might not tell you whether it's worthwhile to change something, it could tell you certain things were on the, the critical path, AKA causing um, you know, uh, others to, to perceive latency. So if this, this is like a very sophisticated ASCII diagram, and if this, this were the log statement which had the 95 milliseconds and, and the yellow boxes were like a failed request, then you could assume that if, if that failed request didn't happen, that, that specific one would have taken a lot less time. So if you were either in the performance uh, troubleshooting mode, um, you, could, you could quickly understand um, you know, why, why you know, some extra processing may have taken place. And, and notably, you know, you'd have other metadata about this, like for example, which cluster it's in, what application, and so uh, you might know, like, is this a tier, tier zero service for me? Is, is this a um, you know, very, very important customer? Does it, ha does it relate to the request ID that maybe my customer had in his logs? So it's a lot more context, but it's a lot, uh, it's, it's a singular uh, request in nature. And when I say that, I mean that, you know, like, usually we're, we're, we're looking at, um, in, in traces at, at uh, of course, you know, in microservices architecture, we may hit many, many, many services, hundreds of them, but like an initial request started, and then that, that, that made a whole bunch of other things happen. And so when I say one request, I mean basically the, the one, the, the customer-facing request. And so, so then we can, we can play games to figure out what caused that, that to occur. Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts? Do you have thoughts? about the difference between these three? Yeah. Well, I can read, I can read. You can, oh, read. that's right, no. Oh, read. okay, yeah. No, no you can't. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, ho hopefully some of these things were, were helpful to, to get through. We, we've got some other ways of looking at the same information. Um, but the main idea is that, you know, log, logs have been around, will be around. Um, people are kind of used to that. It may be the primary way people uh, look at troubleshooting um, their services today, there are other ways of, of, of looking at it. And some are, are like populations or trends in, in nature. And then uh, trace is, is another way of looking at individual requests as, as they could fan out across your service graph. I've certainly got second thoughts. Well, okay. Yeah, and, and you know, when we think it, about, I, I think you had mentioned earlier that sometimes that Venn diagram sh switches the other way and yeah. you, you try to do things like, uh, inferring metric data from logs, for example. And of course there's uh, a number of companies out there that do that um, you know, as their chief uh, business proposition, really. But, yeah. um, but there's dangers but, to but that no kind of thing. But no one here has heard of a monitoring company before, right? That's not, not a thing, is it? <laughs> yeah. The, um, there can be dangers to this sort of thing. You know, it seems initially like, does it matter whether I uh, instrument my application for metrics specifically, or do I just try to infer metrics from logs later on? And there's tricky things that, that really get us, like, it, you know, with the logs, the timestamps that are recorded in logs typically are, um, are just wall time, you know, times in milliseconds, like you said before. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you do have to do that sort of when was the start of this event, when was the end of this event, do some subtraction, those timings are subject to NTP shifts on the host. So you actually may come up with a negative timing or an excessively long timing depending on which direction the clock shifted in the middle of that event. Um, so if you're just looking at, you know, uh, 
a single sample, if you're looking at say a single trace, a spurious uh, event like that may not be a big deal. But if, you, if you're looking at it, uh, you, let's say you infer metrics from logs and you've actually started to build automation on top of that where you start making decisions like killing instances or waking people up in the middle of the night and you're doing that based on timestamps that are shifting, um, it, it'll drive you crazy. So, um, so not, the, I guess the moral of the story is not all these systems are created equally either. There's, there's quite a few differences there. Yeah, let's, let's dig into that. Yeah. So um, like John was saying that if, if, we're, if we're trying to, to look at latency in, in logs, there's, there's a couple ways of doing it. You know, write a couple timestamps. Um, and even if you have only one timestamp, you can still get into trouble. <laughs> um, I mean, time is problem problematic. I don't have enough of it. Um, I wish time NTP would work you right. know, in my favor more often. Right. Um, but, I think John uh, Skeet on Stack Overflow has made a career out of answering NTP shift problems and <laughs> local time discontinuities and, and, and all sorts of other things. That's basically things. Where, where the service will correct the clocks on your servers to yeah. make sure that they're all synchronized. Um, so, uh, so that's the, you know, it's a good idea. It's good to have, have um, uh, that, that shared context, but, but you know, it, it can make some surprising data, like you said. Yeah. Um, metrics are, are interesting um, because, you know, you know, the recording process doesn't often use, use time to do that. We'll, we'll get into that too. Um, but let's go into this. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is that in tracing there's this word span that happens sometimes. Sorry about that. Uh, that's basically a fancy way of saying an operation with, with, with how long it took. So, so for example, if I was calling a database, the span would be like how long did the database call take? Um, so, so it's just a jargony thing. Um, but if I, you know, if, if I were if I were logging, uh, so and if I were doing it without um, using clock time to, to figure out how long something took, then I would use something uh, monotonic time or basically something that only increments, which which won't won't mess up, except for some weird edge cases. Yep. Um, and and time it that way, and that way when the log gets into the file, yeah, of course, the time that that request occurred may be slightly off but at least the duration of it won't be. And um, so, so that's like one, one thing that's, that's used in, in basically all these things where they try to limit the exposure of those uh, wall clock. You always have it because we, we all think it in time, but um, the exposure is a little bit less. And I mean, the, the act of, of logging, this is actually you know, copy pasted mostly from some real code out there. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon to have these things, and one of the things that, that doing logging sort of hints at is that it's all, it's all conventional, right? Where we're looking at formats, um, so that implies something else needs to unpack that, which, which is actually fine. I mean, there's a lot of things that unpack it, um, but you know, it's gonna take a little bit more work to do that both ways. Um, so, so there are some limitations too. And if you look at like metricing the same thing, um, this is some Scala, so, uh, Either that's awesome to you or maybe not. But um, let's say that the, in this case we have like a, a top level concept of a, of, a, of a timer, right? And so, it's a, so this, this is kind of like a, a bit of a nicer API and then it has slots or tags that you can associate these timings with. So you're not writing like, you know, latency equals this, comma, space, whatever. It's actually capturing these, um, these tags really. Um, in a way that they, that they go into the right spot and, and that they'll show up in the, the graphs pretty and, and clickable and such. But you probably have something to add to this. Yeah, you're, you're talking a little bit about tags here. This, this um, particular uh, API here that is being used is timer.start and sample.stop. This is, this is micrometer metrics. So this is the, the uh, metric system underlying Spring Boot 2 and it's been backported back to Spring Boot 1.3, I think. So um, it differentiates itself in this, from something like Drop Wizard metrics, which you may have heard of in the sense that it's a dimensional metric system. So not only are we recording this time, but we can also add additional dimensional data to it. In this case, we're adding the, the response status code to this latency. Yeah. Um, and then on the back end, so these wind up getting represented as individual rows in the monitoring system. And then on the back end, when we're querying that information, we can 
arbitrarily aggregate these tags together. So you may want to look at the overall request latency independent of re response code or you may want to split up and look at the response or the latency for successful status codes versus non-successful status codes. Spoiler, oftentimes non-successful status codes complete much faster than <laughs> successful status codes. Not always, of course, but uh, you know, so if by not dimensionally drilling down on status code, you could be underestimating the the user experience, the, the wait time that your users are waiting for your service to respond. So if hope is in a course of action for reducing latency, creating errors is. Creating errors is? Yeah, because they, they complete a lot faster, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. If you want really fast response times, just HTTP 400 every time. Yeah. All right. Yep. N noted. Everybody got that? <laughs> um, tracing uh, looks a little bit different. It has a little bit more work to do. Because um, if you think about it, it has to use this, this word that some people uh, feel is like demonic almost, stateful, right? So um, metrics are generally stateless. They're, they're passed, passed in tags and parameters. Uh, they don't have to keep track of a lot of thing, things. Um, on the other hand, if you want to get a calls relationship, you have to pass who called what, right? So I might have some HTTP headers that need to go between my systems to say what the parent of this, this, uh, this call is. And so they have to, to do that. That's usually nested inside of this spin thing. Um, and uh, so, th so they have a little bit of work to extract information from headers and, and put them back as they're making calls outbound. They still, they still time things. So that's an interesting overlap with, with metrics. The actual timing facet uh, is often looks very similar, um, but uh, and, and even they have tags which which you can which you can uh, query things by, but um, but they have to do more work to to keep these um, uh, connections between like who called what. And so you know we've got some impact of these. Um, like I think the logging thing uh, was why people use it is because there's there's logging APIs everywhere. Um, and this, when I say coordination, I mean like there's formats and there's tools to deal with these. And so the good, good news is, is that uh, oftentimes uh, it's, a, it's a, a tool of choice because there's so much knowledge out there for, for dozens of years about parsing logs and doing things with it and putting things into them. So, so, so you're not usually in a situation where somebody is like, well, I don't, I mean, maybe they don't know where the log file went, but, but they know how to, how to log. So that, that part is pretty ubiquitous, I'd say. Um, what do you think about metrics? Yeah, on metrics, you know, it, it, the advantage is, of course, um, that it's cheap to collect them. And since we're presenting an aggregate um, to the monitoring system, the, uh, the cost of collecting a metric, um, like a latency metric, doesn't grow proportionally with increased throughput to the service. I say that in general. There's some monitoring systems for which that's not true, but in general, that's that's that should be the idea. Um, but so because we're presenting in disks, be, what's that? So metrics won't fill up your disks like logs do. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But at the same time, it provides the least context because you know you're not going to be able to ref infer from an aggregate what an individual request's performance was, and and so the, and that's not the point of it. Yeah, and, th and this is one of the things where we try to um, tease again the relationships between them. If, for example, your logs, so your metrics and your in your traces have similar tags, then you can kind of get some more context together about a specific type of you know profile, like latency in a certain range. Um, um, but but uh, you know we'll get we'll get more into these relationships later. Yeah. I think one of the things about the the code aspect is that. I think the tracing probably few would argue that it's that's the easiest. Probably most will say it's the hardest um, because it's kind of fragile. Like a applications are put put together in various ways. Um, if, if people are hand coding things, it might be hard to keep these identifiers passing along. I mean, we, we definitely handle all that with Spring Boot and a project called uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth. But rolling your own um, tra tracing code is a lot harder than. Than rolling your own um, true. log statement, <laughs> so um, and, and which kind of bleeds into this this part. Like you know, should should you be writing this sort of code? Um, 
you probably have some times where you need to. Um, but, um, but definitely um, metrics are something that, like, maybe there was some times where, where you wouldn't be able to get statistics um, from, from your apps just by uh, adding a jar file. But that's, that's pretty much not the case in, in Spring at the moment. Like, it's, it's pretty easy to, to have your apps just start spitting out metrics to different places, right? Uh, so I frameworks say, have this. I would say there's a lot of useful metrics that are built into the framework now. We're going to collect your HTTP request metrics tagged with response code and exception and uh, HTTP method and uh, you know all sorts of things. Um, we're going to time your heap utilization, CPU utilization, disk, um, cache utilization. Uh, you know quite a few things now, and, and increasingly so. But there's typically still going to be something about your app that's a key performance indicator that only you know. There's some construct in your app. It's some way you've rolled a cache and how it's performing, or uh, maybe some business metric on you know that that you're going to want to collect. Um, and oftentimes, those things, those custom things, are the real key performance indicators for apps. Um, so l lucky the uh, metrics code is the easiest then, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's one of the things. That, that tracing has a lot of stuff built in, again, for, for HTTP requests. Like, there's lots of demos out there. You can, you can try that. And I mean, one of the things is, like John hinted about, like, some of the ways of, like, hand rolling things that are tough about, like, uh, timestamps and such. There's a lot of edge cases. So, it, you know, it, it, can, it can, get, um, can get hairy, but if you keep to the public APIs and the, and the the recommended patterns of doing things like timing, you can basically leverage other people's code for that. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that, that's there. There's one other thing I'd say about that yep. um, on that slide. Um, who's heard of Istio or Envoy or anything like that? Yeah, pretty exciting, right? Um, the sidecar pattern in general makes this promise to you um, that we're going to do the, the common things for you. We're going to do service discovery for you. We're going to do metrics collection for you. We're going to do th these kind of things for you. Um, and I would say that the, there's, there's always limits to these things. There's limits to what the sidecar can do. The sidecar can observe things that pass through it, but it cannot examine the internal implementation details of your apps. And I would submit to you that as you get further and further along into to like, uh, observability or writing metrics, you're going to find that the key performance indicators for your apps are often not based on things that can be observed by a sidecar or you know the Istio control plane. Um, so and while it's useful, out, while it's useful that there's some you know default collection, it's not going to be complete, and you're going to wind up with a combination of both of those things. And, and by in your app, you mean like you know if I if I have like some repository interface in my Spring app, that's right. Like what that's doing because. It, it doesn't know that it's even a Spring app, maybe. I mean, right. So. I mean, you know, Envoy wouldn't even know that you have a repository layer inside your application. So it's, um, there's always going to be a combination of these things. I, you know, I think you, you probably suspect already that, you know, something like a, a sidecar is not going to be the, uh, the silver bullet for everything, right? Like no, no technology that comes out. And, th and this is really one of its, um, one of its shortcomings. Yeah, if you, if you weren't already hinted by this continual pattern of, Three things, which are not all the same. I think I got that from uh, Sesame Street, um, and I try to oh. carry it with me through life. But I mean, two of them are are similar, <coughs> not the same. Uh, so, it, so there's a there's a few ways that you can do things. John was talking about what I actually have here is, is called Buddy, um, which was like the the way uh, sidecar is like old school way of saying mesh, right? Uh, you can also call it like Buddy, um, and uh, an, an agent which is like if you're in a Java environment or another like uh, system where you can, you can actually affect the, the code that, that um, was deployed. Um, and, and then frameworks, which probably a lot of folks, if they've heard of Spring, are, are, are familiar with. So I mean, Buddy, like AKA Mesh, um, and, you know, the way that that works is it sort of um, controls the boundaries uh, of your apps. Usually your app is, is thinking it's writing somewhere else, but it's actually writing to localhost, and something else is actually just moving the traffic for it, and the app might perceive a very long request um, because the, the agent is actually making you know, follow-up retries and, and other things on its behalf. 
So like one of the things that's interesting about when you're using uh, Mesh or Buddies or whatever is that when they're, when they're performing like things on behalf of the app, um, the app isn't always even aware of it. In fact, that's one of the, the points of it. So um, the app has less information <laughs> itself. So, so uh, it may think that uh, its, its time is a lot longer um, than the actual requests that, that um, got out of the box. So, you, so in a way, you actually need a little bit more insight to connect the two um, because there's these two, two worlds that exist, the things that the app can understand, what it, what it writes in its logs and metrics, and, and what, the, um, what the mesh are doing. Um, I'm not saying it's a problem, it's just a reality. Like you're, you're leveraging an external process to do work for you. And so, uh, so now, you, now you have to look in two places or you have to leverage a system that, that keeps the data in the same place, which is you know, a blossoming of startups. So, uh, uh, and and the, one of the things that, that's nice about the, the buddy or mesh approach is that you know, it's, it's, it's promising a, um, a, a sort of like a black box approach. Like you don't have to change your binaries, you don't have to change your configuration per se to, to get things like tracing because um, it's, the, this thing is actually making the real requests. It can keep track of the headers for you. And, and so you can actually bolt, bolt on some pretty sophisticated features, even if, you know, uh, in apps that you can't control. So that, so that's kind of a nice facet to, to that idea. Um, agents, and, I, and I'm kind of like showing some, some low level code here, but agents is, is a very, very typical common way for application performance management, APM, uh, uh, companies and services and products to, to like make Java apps um, produce stats and traces and everything else that you might click on in a portal. And um, the way that it happens is, is through agents. So it's like a, a Java um, sidecar, if you will. Like, so this is, this is going inside of, of the same JVM. And this is able to intercept um, the, the classes that either you leverage from shared libraries, the ones that you've written yourself, and change them. So, so uh, a lot of times, applications weren't written uh, with observability in mind. Like they may not be using uh, metrics code. Um, and the libraries that they're using may not even be using that metrics code. So, um, so, so I, I would try to say this with an accent, like we have ways of making things traced. And, and so th this is like, we, we can make it happen if we have an agent because th this can actually rewrite the byte code as it's loading to put in um, a tracing code where it needs to be or metrics code where it needs to be. Um, and uh, so, so this is like, for example, if I have a magic trace ID header, this could just insert it um, whether the application knows about it or not. And, and so there's some power there because it can access the um, internal details, like if you have a repository interface or not, um, as well as the network details, like if I'm using Netty or, or something else, it can definitely hook into these places. So, so they're, they're pretty, pretty powerful uh, tools. You also may note that agent-based tracing or agent-based metrics instrumentation has essentially the same limit limitation as the sidecar-based uh, instrumentation. Um, and that's that the agent is only going to collect things that it's determined in advance to collect. Um, so we get this question quite often, you know, Spring Boot 2 is shipped with micrometer including, say, a New Relic implementation. A New Relic also has a Java agent. And so folks will say, is this a replacement for the New Relic Java agent? Or, you know, what, what's the story? Um, and I would say they're complementary to an extent. You know, that the, the New Relic has determined to collect some metrics that it presents to um, its system and they probably have some pre-configured dashboards so you can take advantage of all that. Um, but then there's, uh, and, and there's going to be some things that Spring Boot has auto collected out of the box that are going to overlap with that, but potentially with different names. But then we still get back to this point where um, I, you're going to probably have to collect some custom key performance indicator. And that's where, you know, they, they come together. And you, you see you can use a little bit of the agent-based instrumentation and a little bit of your custom stuff. And it's also probably true or, or is true that some things that, say, New Relic has decided in advance to collect are going to have fewer tags or just less granularity than the things that the framework has decided to collect. Um, 
Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a that's opinions at work, right? I that's mean, right. Yeah, because each of these are they, they're trying to make a consistent experience for their various customers, and it's a really effective yeah. way to get started. Yeah. You know, so nothing wrong with that approach, but it's incomplete. It's the thing to to keep in mind. Um, you know, the other the other three in this section is is a framework. So this is if you haven't looked under the bells of a Spring application, I mean a Spring Boot application before, um, this is how a lot of this stuff works, like we've got ways of poking around and seeing whether something needs to be um, enabled or not. This is like the internals of how Spring Boot Magic comes to be. It will look to see if there are certain classes around, whether it should use configuration related to those classes, whether it should wrap, whether you're using properties. And so this is basically the framework is, is configuring your libraries or auto-configuring uh, your libraries for you. And um, so this, these are actually living in your app. And one thing that I've noticed, that, you know, in support, is that um, you know what one of the advantages is that uh, oftentimes developers can access these things that are being um, you know configuring things, and then you know slap their own thing inside, <laughs> whether it's good or not, um, in, in place of it, um, because it, but because it's it's basically a part of the same app. Um, at the end of the day, we're making jars, right? So, so it, it ends up in that not in wars. That jar. Is yeah. that is that the reference? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Adrian's humor again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is as good as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, point point being, uh, this is uh, also limited by its abstraction. So like the uh, the agent, uh, if we went to the previous slide, you know that can that can actually access some things below. The class loaders of, of Spring and things like that, which which Spring won't be able to see. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, the sidecar. Sometimes they actually have access to, to host level or even kernel level information. Sometimes agents do too, uh, depending on how they're written. Yeah. So, um, of course, you're not going to get the operating system type of story out of, of these things as easily as as you mm -hmm. might with with a host level solution. Yeah. All right, now we're getting into the ops side. So uh, actually, we've always been in the ops side, but we, we wanted to talk about how, how development works and some of the tricks under the scenes. Um, but, but how this data is shipped and how this works ends up affecting your bills. So I figured, why not give you a little bit of insight about how much this stuff grows and, and is it all like those things that fill up your disks and, and, or how do they become things like that? And I mean, you know, logs, logs are, are generally noted to be the largest things. I think there's probably things that could be larger, but it's a fair, fairly safe um, uh, anchor there. And you know, we're, we're, parsing th we're pulling things into a parsing pipeline usually uh, uh, if, we're, if we're making metrics out of them or, or other types of signals. And, um, and so there's a, there's a lot of tooling in that space, like ELK and such. Um, um, now, I, I actually have this a little bit too specific here, but in metrics, you know, there's, there's ways of, of uh, bundling data such that it ends up being a, a constant amount of, uh, of data on the wire, and, it's, and uh, that, that's really handy, um, and, and we'll get into why that is uh, in the slide there. And then, um, so we're gonna talk about two things at the same time. One is like, how fast can you read back this data? So for example, if I'm tailing a log file, Right. If I if I'm following it, then I'm, I'm I'm watching these lines as they happen. But if I have a centralized logging system, usually there's some delay before I can like search through um, Splunk or whatever and, and find those same statements. Maybe it's not much of a delay, but there is some delay. Um, and uh, you know we can use words like near real time or whatever for for a readback. But oftentimes there's a little bit of a delay in logs, there's a little bit of delay in, in metrics getting into the system where you view them, mm -hmm. and, and also there's a little bit of delay in, in traces, and it's important to, to also know um, what types of delay exist there. So let's start with logs. So, so this is one of those things I was mentioning about like, you know, f coordination of the logging patterns. So there, this is a, um, a familiar file to some, I, I would suspect, uh, this, is, this is a uh, uh, log stash uh, file that is using a, a grok plugin, which is basically like super grep. And, and this, this is gonna be something that will allow you to um, know the format of various things like numbers and IP addresses so that you can sort of tag things as a duration or as a, as a client or, or, or whatever. Right. 
such that if later you, you're trying to do searching, um, uh, you'll be able to roll things up by those same uh, labels there. Um, and then um, this is, this is a, I'll start with the, the, the layman's thing because I don't know as much about <laughs> metrics as John does. But, but one of the things that's interesting to know about um, the way that metrics work is, yeah, like let's say you have a surge of traffic. You have 10 times as much <coughs> traffic as you, as you did a, a second ago, maybe 100 times as much. And the, the, one of the nice things is that where you know, metrics uh, makes sure that you have a stable amount of data going out of your process. Like, so that you can actually alert when that happens. Like, you're, that the, the act of reporting the metrics data doesn't crash your, your systems. And one of the ways of doing that is basically, uh, you know, having buckets that are usually automatically assigned or, or you're just not visible of how they're, how they're defined. Um, and you actually just say, uh, you don't, but your, your library underneath will say that there's another one of these. Um, so there's another one of these one millisecond type of requests. And, and um, at the end of the day, instead of um, you know, having a stream where you have something going over the wire every time a request happens with the number, it's actually, it's actually uh, bundled in a couple of ways to make that data stable. And I'll, I'll turn it over to John. There is one notable exception here. Is anybody using StatsD in any form anywhere? A few hands. What, uh, what system are you using StatsD? Datadog or Influx or? Datadog, um, you know, StatsD is the one of the few exceptions to this rule, uh, and that's the spec requires that. I mean, the only way to ship timing data is to ship each individual event, um, and so often in like our new Spring Boot integration, we'll have a Datadog implementation, and we also have the StatsD implementation. So you could ship VS Dog StatsD to Datadog, or you could ship directly to Datadog. And we will state a preference that, for your own sake, where possible, use the direct API rather than StatsD. Because um, by using StatsD as an intermediary, effectively you lose this constant overhead um, irrespective of throughput. We have to wind up shipping an event out. Now, it's not that expensive. Usually it's a UDP packet being shipped out on localhost. Um, but the effect on your application is it generates more short-term garbage. You have to construct a string to ship over the wire for every single event. Um, mm -hmm. And so we know, f and, and that's kind of why we provided both. We know that some folks are using StatsD right now. It's a quick, cheap way to get going. Um, but, you know, be thinking about cost and the, and the difference there as you move forward. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, in, in tracing, uh, that span thing, which, which describes an operation like a HTTP request or, or a database request or my controller being hit. Um, this has some structure to them. Often they're, they're framed in, in JSON or protobuf or something like that. And that, that structured data is definitely going to be larger than just the number put with some, some tags around it. Um, so it's, it, it looks like it would have some, some things in common with metrics. They do. But it's, it's definitely sending per event. Now, it doesn't mean it's literally creating a network connection per event. Usually it's bundling things together. But um, the only way that you can keep that, keep that fidelity, like to be able to draw the tra trace tree, is actually to have that, have that data someplace. Um, and, and so there's, there's some structured data that's, that's sent along. And I would say semi-structured, meaning that some fields would be normalized, like maybe the name and the, the duration. And then some things would be like more open. So, so for example, the tags uh, might allow any arbitrary uh, name and value to be associated with it. And so, so there's, there's semi-structure to that data. And so, yeah, we, we're, we're talking about this data growing. And like the, the ways that it grows, like we know logs grow, they pretty much grow, we know that much. They usually don't grow unless we turn them off. Um, but we also have other ways of controlling it. Logs usually have verbosity settings. Um, you don't, you you'd often don't have verbosity settings with metrics or tracing. Um, maybe uh, you have some things that are for, for longer type of operations, you collect more data. But, um, but uh, usually they're, they're kind of, uh, the, the data collected is, is relatively stable. Um, and there's a huge difference between metrics and, and tracing with re regards to the data on the wire and, and retained um, because metrics through, the, through this 
bundling and stuff, which, which we'll have John have another swipe at, because I think it's important to get this. Um, it ends up being fixed with regards to traffic, meaning that you don't, you know, with the notable exceptions, um, I, I can have a, you know, accidental or, or lovely spike of interest and a DDoS even. And, and my metrics will still stay stable uh, under certain circumstances, whereas uh, my, my tracing will, will grow with the traffic. So if I have a, uh, a spike of traffic, I may have to use this thing called sampling to, to reduce the amount of, um, of data that I get. Um, you know, to, to, to basically keep my bill low. And that sampling is important because, you know, if you were using, like in a world where we don't think you should be in, if you were using only tracing data to try to find, you know, poor user experience, for example, depending on the sampling algorithm, it could be more likely than not or less likely than not, again, depending on, it could be more likely than not that you're basically sampling away all the bad things. Um, and so that's why it's really key that, you know, somewhere in your pipeline you have, you know, some metric type data that's fixed with regards to traffic so that you, you don't miss out on those things. You may not be able to drill down into the individual event and determine what its constituent latencies are, but at least you know it happened. And that's the key. Yeah. And, I mean, and it's fixed with, with regards to how well you, um, you use your, your metrics too. <laughs> So I mean, right. one of the things that's pretty neat about um, the micrometer library is it helps you like deal with with uh, with the cardinality. So like, let's just say, for example, I have um, a bunch of HTTP endpoints that are important to my customers. Well, I don't want a metric per ID in my catalog, right? Because that's no longer fixed with regards to yeah. traffic. Because somebody could be looking at every single ID in my catalog, and now I have. You know, thousands and thousands of metrics, yeah. right? So, yep. so how, how does that work? So, like, micrometer has facilities to um, there's there's meter filters to help you cut out tags that um, that grow uh, in a nasty way, um, and there's also you know there's meter filters to preemptively cap the total cardinality of a metric name, just in case you mess up. Um, and what's nice about meter filters is somebody can. If you've got an organization with a large code base and core libraries and applications and a lot of layers in between, somebody can mess up down here and at the application layer, you can apply a meter filter that shunts a part of the metrics coming out of that mm -hmm. core library so that uh, you could deal with that later on. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so I mean, reducing usually ends up being filter in nature. I mean, when, when we talk about uh, reducing our logs, you know, Ideally, we can try not to log irrelevant data, but things like errors are sometimes hard to predict, and, and also they're very good for getting to the bottom of things. So, um, and, and, and as well, well filtering, um, you know, you know, de deciding not to send to your either your aggregation or stream or or your normal files certain types of messages, um, or or from certain um, things. That's that's where like log4j config files. You know, can tell you which handlers and which which categories get what type of traffic or get none. Um, and, and one thing I, I, I worked at Twitter for a little while, and, and we had a, this uh, problem where our, our observability systems, our, our metrics and telemetry systems, were very expensive, and um, people were putting metrics on everything under the sun, and the frameworks would make a thousand metrics, yeah. and and that actually does create cost. It does, it does. like they, they aren't free. And so there's, pro you know, we had actually like meta metrics, like how many of the metrics were ever, ever read? Like, yes. were they ever used in any kind of alert? Did anybody ever read those? And I mean, it's sort of like a growing pains when you're trying to figure out what to do. And one of the reasons why I sort of kind of discourage writing metrics unless you know it's a key metric, uh, not to say that you shouldn't write metrics, it's just that um, sometimes it's hard to guess too. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, in, in worst case, you could get to a situation where you're causing a, a lot of, uh, of cost with, yeah. with no value out of it. Um, and then there's another way. What, 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 is, grain? Like, what, what does that mean? Like, let's say, oh, shoot. I'm asking you a question that they, I have the answer to. Yeah. <laughs> you wrote that. OK. Uh, I wrote that. Um, so, so by coarser grain, uh, what I was getting at was that sometimes people look at things like, uh, request per second, um, and then sometimes, like if you're at Netflix, 
you, maybe you're not so interested in, in Netflix streams started per second. Maybe it's streams started per minute, or or sure. per like. There's different ways, and then your your retentions can be different too. Uh, so, so for example, I might um, be able to perform analysis on a, 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 a one minute window right. as opposed to a five second window. And, and yeah, and one many monitoring systems, with the notable exception of Prometheus, are push based. So you ship your metrics every once in a while. And since we're shipping aggregates, we're not shipping them every second. We're shipping them on some predetermined interval. Um, and so what do you set that interval to be? Often f folks, you know, they're coming to it, will say five seconds. We're going to ship every five seconds or something like that. And we try to say, like, um, what's your mean time to resolution expected to be? <laughs> if, it's, uh, if it's between five and ten seconds, then go ahead and ship at five second intervals. But um, if it's longer than that, it's okay to, you know, ship metrics every two minutes or every minute, um, you know, knowing that you're going to be alerted to a problem within one or two minutes of it happening, that's pretty good for a lot of organizations. And shipping every one minute or two minutes is, you know, literally like, you know, uh, you know several orders cheaper than shipping once every five or ten seconds. So, Someone can do the math and yeah. tell us exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I should have used ten seconds rather than five. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's use tens next time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and then tracing, uh, we mentioned this thing, sampling, that just means that in um, the most like, naive implementation is like probabilistic, like one out of 100 uh, you know, requests will have a trace. It still actually works pretty well for um, things like uh, when, when you have a lot of traffic volume and, and you have the same sorts of clients, um, you, you'll definitely get some patterns that emerge pretty consistently. Um, and, and the word consistent needs to apply here in tracing because uh, when you're looking at tracing, you're expecting to like look at how the world existed for the life of that request. So uh, it's often not a great thing to have a trace that starts here and then it doesn't take data here and then it does take data here and <laughs> doesn't because then you don't actually know what happened anymore. So, so oftentimes, at least when starting, you'd, you'd want to have um, either the entire operation or, n or none of it. And, and that's, that's often how the libraries and systems are configured by default, which is that by default they would, they would either capture everything related to this request or, or nothing. All right. Well, anyway, let, we're almost out of time, so let's stitch it together. Um, we know they have different you know, pros and cons. We know each of them can index and tag and, and things, or you can at least pull indexes out of them. You probably have things in your environment, right? You have, you have things that are constants. You have clusters. You have um, IP addresses and stuff like that. Oftentimes, there's ways of correlating these things. And um, this is, this is kind of like the outro here, which, which is kind of a neat, neat thing, I think, to, to talk about. Yeah, we're, we're working towards this, like further integration of these things. And this is an example that came out of Google um, where that same latency heat map you saw earlier for a latency could be um, decorated with little stars here, the stars representing exemplar traces. Um, so I mentioned before, you can't just look at a single trace and know whether it's representative of the normative case or an extreme case. But if you took a latency heat map like this and you started plotting exemplars on top of it, you could click on a star that you know, was you know, out of the norm and click on a star that was in the norm and compare them and see the differences between them. So this is the kind of output I think you'll see from us going forward as we try to stitch these things together a little more closely. That's, that's uh, quite great. And uh, I mean, if you want to take, take away, you can take away what you want. I mean, just they have some strengths, uh, patterns, uh, what to mm -hmm. alert on, um, which ones can answer whys and which type of whys can they answer. Uh, so for example, metrics can answer certain types of whys that, that traces can't. Um, definitely, uh, we'll post these slides. And um, I mean, John says something about uh, stars. Can you hit escape and pull up the web browser to micrometer? Yeah. Uh, because star stars are, you know, they, they you exist the, in, in, um, in all sorts of places. Like, for example, th those stars can happen here. Um, so if, if you like micrometer and you use micrometer, you should probably or stick, smooth. <laughs> click, click yeah. the star on it too. Yeah. He'll be happy. Um, and. Uh, because there's, there's a lot of nice work that goes on to making these things. I think you have some other sessions going on. I, I know I'm talking not on Not on metrics. Nothing on metrics? Yeah, Spinnaker stuff. Right? Uh, if you're more interested in tracing, uh, Martine and I are doing a talk on, on Thursday. 
so, um, but also you can you can grab us uh, after after the session. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or not. We Somebody should. Can. Yeah. Okay, we do. All right. So, four minutes. Uh, we got four minutes. So, anybody want to uh, talk more? In the back. Um, so the question was about intelligent sampling. And so there, there's actually a, a stream of, of work in, in Sleuth. So this is tracing, like, so for example, how, how uh, you get more data. Like, so, so one of the things that's, that's uh, quite interesting is uh, uh, in, in tracing, um, you know, there's this volume problem. And so sometimes people will be collecting things locally uh, and, and then uh, trying to make some decisions later based on a larger amount of data. Um, one of the things that's, that should be in uh, Sleuth 2.1 is, is a, uh, a handler system which, which can enable things like uh, sending 100% of data to a cheaper place uh, which can then feed back into intelligent uh, sampling decisions. Um, but as, as uh, it's a pretty advanced question but, um, but I would just say follow, follow the Fire, ha fire hose uh, discussions in, in uh, Zipkin and related channels because we do have some sites uh, like Yelp are, are experimenting with some things about how to, how to get 100% uh, data cheaply because one, one of the biggest problems that usually are the case is, is, a, is a cheap cheap part of it. Um, also I think some of the collector technology that, that census which is the other thing is talked about, that's not precluded from being able to be used uh, with other trace, tracing uh, libraries and things. So, so we have to also follow around how that, how that works. And then finally, I, I personally have been working with, a, uh, with uh, uh, helping with relationships with this uh, Expedia project called uh, Haystack. And uh, Haystack is, has got a lot of like anomaly detection services and, and uh, they don't have their sampling code open source yet, but we'll definitely be uh, fast following that as another, another route. Usually what happens with, with sampling is that they have some uh, deployment opinions. And um, like for example, Twitter's first one had Zookeeper, not everybody uses it. So, so um, there will be definitely some solutions coming out and, and Firehose will be a label to look for for that. I think that's about all the time we have. Thank you for joining us and we'll be available. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>